epistle of 1 John, and we're looking at chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. 1 John, toward the end of your Bible, the last book should be Revelation, and then Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. So we're there looking at chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And as you're turning there, let's take a moment and pray together. Uh, Father, we ask for your help now as we uh, open your word to expound your word and explain your word and proclaim your word and apply your word. We pray that you would, um, that you would do all of these things now in a way that shapes and forms and presses these realities deep within our hearts so that we are deeply affected by them so that we might be growing as a people that represent and reflect your love to one another and to a world who desperately needs to know it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, about this time of year in 1992, the U.S. military mission Restore Hope began in Somalia. And initially, this mission was merely meant to provide humanitarian relief to Somalia. And while it began with this kind of narrow, specific mission from the U.S. to provide humanitarian relief, it slowly expanded to become something almost unrecognizable within less than a year. And not long after it began, the mission expanded to become a mission of not just the U.S., but the U.N. as well. After American troops and the U.N. peacekeepers touched the ground, the complications in Somalia seemed to expand the mission almost endlessly. Eventually, tensions led to the clan of a Somali warlord attacking and killing over 20 US peace, or UN peacekeepers. And after this, the UN Council met, and they determined that this warlord must be brought to justice. And so eventually, this led to the Battle of Mogadishu, in which multiple American soldiers died. And at the end of it, many were left scratching their heads, asking, how did a, a simple mission of providing humanitarian relief end up like this? The answer, according to some experts, is mission creep. Mission creep is this, this very subtle expansion of a mission beyond its original goals. A mission might begin with you know, clear, a clear set of goals and desired outcomes, but often... After initial succession, or successes, those in charge of the mission may become more ambitious or maybe complications on the ground seem to require a wider scope of goals. Or whatever the reason may be, a, a mission, mission creep often results in an utter failure of the original intent of the mission in the first place. As we come to the season of Advent, we're, of course, remembering and celebrating that the eternal Son of God has come into the world. And Advent is a word that simply means arrival or coming, as we've already seen. Perhaps, you know, Advent, we're talking about the Advent of a, an event, a person, a thing, whenever we talk or use the word Advent. Uh, a hot topic in our world right now is how the Advent of social media is affecting us as people. So many people are talking right now about how the arrival, the coming of social media has affected us personally, emotionally, socially, mentally, and it's not good in case you were wondering. But during the season of Advent, we, we look forward to the second Advent of Christ as well as remember His first. We remember that He's come to take on our humanity, that He's come to be born of the Virgin Mary, that He's come to become like us in every respect and yet without sin. And of course, we call that in the Christian tradition the Incarnation. And this is a wonderful time or opportunity for us to consider this enormously important question, probably the most important question we could ever ask in life, and it's this, why? Why has the Son of God come into the world? What, what was His mission, if we could put it that way? And it's a really important question for us to ask because of the potential problem of mission creep. Not that Jesus struggled with mission creep. He is crystal clear as to why He came what he came to accomplish, what he came to do, but we so often struggle with it. 
Actually, more than ever in my life, if I see it in the last couple of years, plenty of examples of misunderstandings and misrepresentations among Christians as to why the Son of God has come into the world. So often we fall into treating Jesus as a, a mascot of our causes and campaigns and convictions, and we forget to actually consider what the Bible has said about His coming. We make Jesus a mascot for our partisan political groups. We make Him a mascot for our preferred economic systems. We make Him a mascot for our particular political causes. And maybe it's not that. Maybe we treat Jesus as a, a mascot for our self-improvement projects. Maybe we treat Him as a, a means to the end that we might feel better about ourselves and about our lives, that He exists in our imaginations to give us an emotional uplift or improve our self-esteem. Or perhaps... Like many of the preachers you hear on TV, perhaps we feel that Jesus has come to make us healthy and wealthy. He's the mascot of the American dream. He's come to give us the, the, the car we want, the house we want, the salary we want, the family we want, the life we want, and, and all of that. And, and, and there's more, but suffice it to say, we can come to this season and remember and celebrate the coming of the eternal Son of God into the world, all the while completely missing why He's come. And so perhaps there's no better time to consider, why has Jesus come? And thankfully, we don't have to guess at this, because the Bible tells us. Jesus himself tells us in Luke 19.10, when he said that he came into the world to seek and to save the lost. The Apostle Paul echoes those words in 1 Timothy 1.15, when he, he writes that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he's come, to seek and save the lost, to save sinners. And of course, that just begs another question. What does it mean to save? What, what kind of salvation has Christ come to save us with? What does the word save mean biblically? And of course, while there's no way we could sufficiently exhaust that word in four short weeks during our Advent sermon series, our goal will be to explore and explain that very word and seek to answer that very question. With what kind of salvation has Christ come to save us? Well, this morning, we turn to see that Christ has come to save us by becoming our propitiation. Christ was incarnate to become our propitiation. I know that's a big word, but it's an important word, and, and we want to grow in understanding and applying that word today. And so if you'd like to stand with me, for the reading of God's holy and precious word now. Let's listen with reverence and rejoicing, with open ears and open hearts to the word of God as it's written here by the Apostle John in 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. Well, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. You can be seated. Well, we're dropping in here on the first letter of the Apostle John. And just to, if you were to do a simple read through, this, this epistle would tell you that he's writing to a church in crisis. It seems that uh, false, unchristian, unbiblical beliefs have been slowly creeping into the church to whom John is writing. False beliefs about Christ and about his salvation had, had taken hold among some people. And as a result, some of this church's members, some of its leaders even, have departed from the faith. Those that, that John's audience would have called friends, fellow saints, brothers and sisters, they those they, they would have shared meals with in their homes, those whose baptisms they would have celebrated, those they would have gathered with around the communion table. Some of them had begun to deny Christ and depart from the church. 
And so he's writing to a church that's hurting here, a church that's struggling with doubt and fear and confusion, and therefore he's writing with a specific goal in mind, and that goal is to bolster their faith and grow them in assurance. He's writing to strengthen their faith and increase their confidence in the Lord Jesus and in who they are in him. And so he writes offering a series of tests by which they can, they can test themselves to see whether or not they're in the faith, whether or not God is at work among them, whether or not they are a true church. And John doesn't give these these tests to merely challenge them, but in an effort to assure them, to show them that they do indeed belong to God, that they are in the faith, that they are a true church. And there's three tests. There's the truth test. And in this, they're, they're to test whether or not their beliefs are in accordance with the word of God, by the grace of the spirit of God. And the apostle desires that the truthfulness of their beliefs would show them that they are indeed Christ, that they belong to him, that they're in the faith. And then there's the obedience test. They're to test themselves by their obedience. Not that they never sin, but do they desire to obey the Lord Jesus? Are they growing in obedience to the Lord Jesus? Are they living lives of repentance? Are they striving to obey the Lord? Are they taking God's side against their sin in life? And in this, John wants them to see that they do desire to obey the Lord, that they are growing. And by this, he wants them to be assured. And then lastly, there's the love test. And the love test is an encouragement to consider whether or not they have love for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, because that's a, that's a crucial test of whether or not we are in the faith, is if we love one another as Christians. And these three tests are each repeated several times throughout the book of 1 John, and they're brilliantly interwoven with one another. But we come to one of the love tests this morning. And in this love test, I think we read one of the richest passages in all of the New Testament, in all of the Bible, really. It's a passage replete with gospel doctrine showing us astounding and essential truths about the Lord Jesus, but it also casts a beautiful vision for us to be a Christian community formed by that precious doctrine. And we want to slowly walk through it this morning with our eyes open on our Bibles, our ears attentive to Christ's Word, and as we do, I hope for us to see here the root of why God sent His Son, which is love, His love, the reason that God sent His Son, which is propitiation, and the result from God sending His Son, which is that we would love as we have been loved. Verse though, let's look at the root of why God sent his son. Again here, John is writing regarding this love test. And in this, he's exhorting us to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. But moreover, John tells us that the basis, the reason Christians ought to and do love one another is because of who our God is. Look at verses 7 and 8. John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Right? John says, we're called to and do love one another because the God that we know and worship is himself love. Right? He says that God is the source of love in the created order. It's similar to, to the way the sun gives life to the earth and all who live in it. From the light and heat emanating from its being, so there is love in God's creation because it emanates to us from Him, from His being, from His nature, from His essence. True love exists in creation because it comes from God. And so, John says, anyone who claims to know and worship this God also ought to reflect His love to others. John explains this by showing how how love exists comes from God. He says love doesn't just come from God. It's not just that that love is this thing that God created or that God has. It's not just that God has a loving disposition. John says in verse 8 that God is love. God is love. Now if we go back to 1 John 1, 5, we'd see there this is not the first time the apostle has used this kind of language. There he says that God is light. Now what's he saying there? To speak about light in this way is to speak about God's holiness, His righteousness, His goodness, His purity, His truthfulness. It's to say say that God is light is to say that God not only has light, in other words, He not only has holiness and righteousness and goodness. No, He is holiness 
and righteousness and goodness. He is pure holiness, righteousness, and goodness. In other words, God's nature is identical with the attributes of holiness. He is the perfection of holiness. It's not as if there's some standard out there of holiness and righteousness and purity that God must meet and that he meets and therefore he is considered holy and righteous and pure. No, he is the standard for how we ought to define those attributes. He is those attributes. He is light. And now John says the same about God's love. He says it's not merely that God has love. He is love, right? His nature, his essence as the eternal and infinite God is identical with love. And I know this is difficult to comprehend. It's really impossible to comprehend. Because part of the problem is that we like to think of God as as maybe existing on something of a spectrum. Like he's just like us, but just a bigger and better version. He's like us, but on cosmic steroids. Right? He loves like us. It's just it's just bigger and better. That's how we tend to think of God. But my friends, thinking of God in this way will inevitably lead to an impoverished view of who He is because He's not like us. He's not a bigger and better version of us. He is wholly other. Our words fail to fully describe Him. Our minds fail to fully comprehend Him. And this is true when it comes to the fullness, the infinitude, the purity of His love. And when we tend to think of love, right, we tend to think of it as merely in terms of having affection for someone else. But my friends, God is not subject to affections and emotions like we are, right? What exists in us as affection or emotion is a perfection in God. He is the perfection of love. He is infinite and unchanging and unwavering in his love. There's nothing that can be done to diminish or lessen God's love like can be done to our love because nothing can ever diminish or lessen God. He's infinite and therefore his love is infinite. He is unchanging, therefore his love is unchanging. He is all powerful, therefore his love is all powerful. There's nothing that can make God, God's love greater because there's nothing that can make God greater. He's already infinitely great. Therefore, his love is already infinitely great. It's unchanging and infinite and incomprehensible because God is all those things. It's one of my favorite hymns. So beautifully puts it. Could we with ink the ocean fill? Or were the sky of parchment made, were every tree on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God would drain the ocean dry, nor could a scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. God is infinite and holy and incomprehensible in His unfathomable and omnipotent love. And of course, we would be remiss here if we didn't talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is an an essential and central Christian doctrine. And to, to maybe to oversimplify it a little bit, it simply means that we believe in one God who is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That there's only one God, only one being who is God, but that that one being, as he shares one essence, one nature, one substance, also eternally exists in three persons. And listen, that's that's not some remote, unimportant, indifferent belief that we hold to still because someone somewhere in Christian, Christian history said it was important. No, this is of crucial importance. First, it's because it's just simply who our God is. If we're concerned that we worship and know the one true God and not an idol, we need to know that our God is triune. But also... This is a captivating, enthralling, satisfying doctrine because, listen, this is the only way something like God being love could be true. Take a moment to think about it. A Unitarian God cannot be love. A Unitarian God, a God who is singular in being without being a plurality of persons, cannot be love. He might learn to love. He might even yearn for love. But the Only, only a triune God can be loved because love requires an object. St. Augustine, an African pastor who lived about 1,500 years ago, put it this way. He said that love requires that there be a beloved. It requires 
If our God is to be loved for all of eternity, it requires that for all of eternity, the Father has loved the Son and the Spirit. And the Son has loved the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit has loved the Father and the Son. You see, if, if, if there were not a mutual love between these divine persons, if God were not a trinity, but merely a unitarian divinity, He could neither be loved nor be God because there would be no one prior to created beings in existence that He could love. Only a God who is eternally singular in being, but plur- plural in persons could be loved, and this is who our God is. For all of eternity, our one in three God has existed in a state of perfect love between the persons of the Trinity. And I know that's a lot of complicated doctrine. Here's one thing that that means for you and for me, for all of us. Is that in no way does, is, is God's love dependent upon us. God's love is not a response to you. You understand, there's there's nothing you can do to diminish God's love. There's nothing you can do to enlarge His love. He loves because He is love. He is completely and totally self-sufficient in His love. His love is not needy. It's not dependent on any outside causes. His love never began. It will never end. And Christian, that is the kind of love with which God loves you. He loves you with what Sally Lloyd-Jones calls a never-stopping, never-giving-up, unbreaking, always and forever love. He loves you with a love you can't change, you can't diminish, because God can't be changed or diminished. He loves you with a love you can't enlarge, because God's love can't be enlarged. He is infinite and limitless in himself. Herman Bovink calls God an immeasurable ocean of being. And if God is an immeasurable ocean of being, then He is an immeasurable ocean of love. That's who your God is. And that is the root of why the Son of God has come into the world, because God is love. God loves, and so He sent His Son. And this makes sense because true love always takes the form of concrete action. True love is is always manifested in some way, shape, or form, right? Love merely in abstract, in word, in talk, is not true love at all, as 1 John 3.18 tells us. True love leads to deeds and action. And so when God looked upon sinful humanity, humanity that rebels against Him and hates Him and rejects Him, in His great love, He took action. Look at verses 9 and 10 here to see the reason that God sent His Son. Verse 9 tells us that the, the reason God sent His Son is our life. Listen, he writes, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Of course, we're, we're just coming out of three Sundays in Genesis 3, aren't we? And so we ought, we ought to have fresh in our minds the fact that we don't deserve life. Rather, because of our sin, because of our rebellion, because of our cosmic treason, against the God of all heaven and earth. We deserve death, eternal death, immediate death. And yet by God's marvelous and matchless grace, the Son of God is put on flesh and became incarnate so that we would not meet the fiery end we deserve, but rather that we might have life. And how will He accomplish this? How will He give the gift of life, eternal life, to a bunch of death deservers like us. Keep reading in verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation for our sins. How will He procure life for sinners? Propitiation. Now what is propitiation? It's a very important word in the Bible. It's actually one of the reasons we like to use the ESV translation here, particularly in preaching, because some other translations, even other good translations, very well might translate the Greek word here as atoning sacrifice or as expiation. And hear me, those are, those are precious truths. Your translation might say that. Those are precious truths. Christ did die as our atoning sacrifice. 
But that phrase is too general and not specific enough to translate the Greek word here well. Expiation is a precious truth. Expiation means the the removal of guilt by means of sacrifice. And we believe that around here, right? That, that, That Christ died to remove our guilt from us. That if you trust in Christ, your guilt has been taken away, washed by his crimson flood. That's precious. But that's not what this word means here. And you know, there are some words in, in Greek in the New Testament that can sometimes be hard to translate. There are some words that have, you know, multiple meanings. And it's hard to truly figure out which is being represented in the specific text you're in. And so it's hard to figure out how to translate it. Or, or sometimes we just don't have words in English that correspond to exactly what we're trying to translate in Greek. Sometimes that happens. That's not what's happening here. Not anymore. In fact, at one point, there wasn't an English word that corresponded to the the Greek word translated here. And so about 500 years ago, translators invented an English word that held the exact meaning of the Greek word here in our text. And the word they invented was the word propitiation. It's a word invented about 500 or so years ago in English so that we could accurately translate texts like Romans 3.25, Hebrews 2.17, 1 John 2.2 2 and 1 John 4.10 here. So what does this word mean? It means a wrath-appeasing sacrifice. It means a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. All right, we just sang about this last week. Every time we sing in Christ alone, we sing, till on that cross that Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ, I live. When we sing those words, we're singing about propitiation. We sing about Christ as the sacrifice that appeased the wrath and anger and righteous indignation and judgment of God on our behalf. That's propitiation. He's turned the wrath of God toward us into favor, into forgiveness. He's appeased the wrath of God. Now, as you can imagine, this doctrine is not without its detractors. There are a number of challenges that both Christians and non-Christians level at this doctrine in the world today. And of course, we don't have time to survey them all this morning, but one challenge that seems particularly relevant to our text this morning is that really this doctrine doesn't match with what we know about the love of God, right? Right? We know that that our God is a God of love. Our very passage this morning says that God is love, right? And so some might say it's not fitting for a God of love to be a God of wrath and for his wrath to need to be appeased. A God of love would not be angry, some might think. He would just forgive. It doesn't make sense, some people think. Of course, we should remember that 1 John not only tells us that God is love, but that God is light. He is love, but He is also holiness and righteousness and purity and goodness. He is truth, and because of His holiness and righteousness, He must also be a God of wrath against sin and sinners who rebel against Him and who commit cosmic treason against Him. So we have not loved him as we ought, as we see here in verse 10. Instead, we we have hated God. A human being, by nature now, from Genesis 3 on, we run from God. We seek to de-God God. In fact, in and of ourselves, we hate God. By nature, we hate God so much that we would kill him if we could. And as the cross of Christ attests, that's precisely what we tried to do and did. And thus, if God were to fail to be a God of wrath in light of such horrendous, putrid, gruesome sin, He would not be light. And if He were not light, He would not be God. And so God, therefore, must be a God of wrath. What's more is that love and wrath are, are, are not at all opposed to one another. Like we might sometimes think in our fallen human notions of love. 
In fact, we, we, should, we should be prepared to say that real love must sometimes be accompanied by wrath. You know, if, if you ever wanted to see or feel my wrath, this is all you'd have to do. Attack my wife or my children. If someone were to attack my wife or my children, I would be filled with anger and indignation. I'd be filled with a thirst for justice. And I'm sure that you feel the same about others in your family and in your inner circle. Why? Because you love them. Your wrath in that instance would come from a place of love. And what's more is that if you weren't angry or wrathful or filled with indignation over someone attacking your family or your loved ones, well, we might think that you don't really love them at all, wouldn't we? Or at least that there was something deeply wrong with you. And just so, when human beings sin against the triune God who's been filled for all of eternity with mutual love and the plurality of persons, when human beings sin against one another as God's beloved precious image bearers, our God, who is love, is angry. And thus, if we are ever to be recipients of His favor and objects of His forgiveness, His anger, His wrath, must be propitiated. His wrath must be appeased. His righteous indignation must be satisfied. And here's the good news. Our God, who is love and light, has himself provided propitiation. He didn't demand that we make it. He made it for us on our behalf. And he's done it by his own son. The second person of the Trinity, the second person of the God who is love and light, who is filled with indignation towards sinners, but who simultaneously loves sinners, he has come in the incarnation to become our propitiation. He died on a cross of wood. And on that cross, he soaked up the wrath of God on behalf of all those who place their faith and trust in him. So that now, whoever is united to Christ by faith, whoever trusts in Christ and depends on him for salvation, God's righteous wrath is no longer directed toward you at all. Your sin, far, far from prompting God's wrath towards you, now, Thomas Watson, the Puritan Thomas Watson, tells us that your sin prompts his pity and his love and his yearning over you all the more. Right? He does hate your sin. But as Watson says, he hates it in the same way that, that we might hate some loathsome disease or pain plaguing someone we love. And thus his anger, rather than being against you now, is completely for you and is turned toward your sin and all that plagues you in this life. But it's not in any way directed toward you. Instead, now you are purely an object of his divine favor and forgiveness and love. That's the doctrine of propitiation. That is the reason John gives here for the reason that the reason of the coming of Christ. This is why God sent his son, the mission of Jesus is to accomplish propitiation. This is the concrete expression of the love of God. But then lastly, we need to consider what kind of life this is all beckoning us to. Remember that John here is giving us a vision for the kind of community we ought to be in light of these precious truths. As people of the love of God expressed in the advent of Christ and the incarnation and Christ's propitiation, how then should we live? In Ray Ortland's parlance, in light of this gospel doctrine, we ought to embody a, a, a gospel culture. And what, is, what does a gospel culture look like according to this text, verses 11 and 12 tell us? It's to be a culture of love. This is the result from God sending His Son the Apostle John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. In other words, he, he says that, that we have been 
objects of abounding and astounding love. We are recipients of the greatest love history has ever known. And as such, we ought to love one another. Right? And, and, and that just makes sense. We know that well-loved people love people well. And Christian, there is no one better loved in all the universe than we are. And in fact, John says, this is how we can make the invisible God visible, as it were, right? Of course, we know that God is spirit. He's not a being with body or parts. He's not visible to us, except, of course, in the body of Christ taken on in the incarnation. And in the Son's incarnation, we have seen the love of God manifested, haven't we? But now that Christ is risen and ascended, the calling to be the visible representation and manifestation of divine love in the earth is laid upon us as God's people. And just as the light of the sun is not visible at night, except that it's reflected to us from the moon, so as objects of divine love, we are to reflect the light of God's love to one another and to a world in need of such love. And when we live in this way, John says, God's love is perfected in us. Or another way to to say that would be to say that God's love is completed in us. And what does that mean? It, It doesn't mean that there's something lacking in God's love that needs to be made up for in our love, right? Perish the thought. Rather, it means that the goal of God's love being expressed to us in the incarnation and propitiation of Christ is achieved when we live lives of love toward one another in the church. When we love one another. That's, that's, the intended result of our salvation here, living together as a community of love. Of course, there's probably not a word more abused or misunderstood than that one in our cultural moment. What does it mean to love? As we see in the love of God spoken of in our text this morning, it means in one sense that we move toward one another and care for and concern for one another. So we don't, we don't keep a distance from one another because of the sin and mess of one another's lives. That's not what Christ did, is it? No, he, he came to us in our sin and in our mess. He came in the incarnation to be a propitiation. And just so, if we love, we will move toward one another in care and concern and help. We'll move toward one another even in our sin and weakness. Or another way we manifest this kind of love. 1 John 3.18 says, love looks like this. It looks like practical help when we see one another in need. He says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? That's that's what love looks like. It looks like practical help when we see a brother or sister in need. As 1 Corinthians 13 puts it, what does love look like? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, right? It's flexible. It prefers others. It it, it says, hey, you know what? I don't need to get my own way in this. I'm willing to to be flexible here and and adjust myself to your concerns. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Those words weren't originally written for a couple on their wedding day. Right? They were written for a local church and their life with one another, their life together. That's, that's what we're being called to here in our church, in our time, in our life with one another. That's what a culture of love looks like, patience, kindness, Humble truth-telling, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And listen, I I know that because we live in a time of individualism and self-centeredness, that some of us even right now, in hearing this exhortation to love, the primary question we're considering is actually this, whether or not we've been loved like this in our families, 
in our church? Have I been loved like this? That, I know that's the automatic thought some of us might have. I want to encourage you, if that's you, to shift your thinking. I don't think that's what John wants you to be asking right now. Not as, as long as we are individuals that go around asking whether or not we've been loved well enough, loved as we ought to be loved, our concerns are going to be selfish and self-centered. Because none of us have been loved as we ought to be loved, we're also going to go around feeling slighted and isolated and with a chip on our shoulder. But if we shift the question and start asking whether or not we love as we have been loved by God. If we're contributing to making the love of God visible and felt in our community, if we are faithfully living as people of the incarnation and propitiation of Christ, then and only then will we begin to contribute to building the kind of loving community we're being called to here, which is also the kind of community wherein we will be well-loved in turn. And I remember hearing a story some time ago about a little boy back in the 1860s in the city of Chicago. Every, every Sunday morning, this little boy would get up, he'd get dressed, he'd grab his Bible, and he'd walk to the, the Illinois Street Church in Chicago, Illinois, the church that would later come to be known as the Moody Church, D.L. Moody. It was quite the walk. The little boy actually passed several other churches on his way to the Illinois Street Church, and so eventually a man who attended one of those, those churches that the young boy passed every Sunday on his way to church took notice. And every Sunday he noticed this young boy walking intently, Bible in hand, and eventually the man decided to inquire about the boy's destination. And so he stopped the young boy one Sunday morning. He said to him, hey, where do you go to church? The boy replied, I, I go to Mr. Moody's church. And thinking that quite a long walk for a little boy on a Sunday morning, the man asked, well, Son, that, that church is a long way from here. Why do you walk so far and pass so many churches along the way? Which is a good question. But the boy also gave a good answer. He said, well, you see, sir, that they just have a way of loving a fellow over there. Do we have a way of just loving a fellow here? Do you have a way of, of just loving a fellow? Do people see and feel the love of God in this community? Are we people of the advent of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, the propitiation of Christ? My friends, I think you are. I think many of you just love one another so well. Not perfectly, of course. No community does. Part of why our love for one another must include, as Paul calls us to in Romans 16, to forgive one another, to be patient with one another. But I do think that you love one another. So my only word of exhortation to you would be this, just as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.10. But we urge you, brothers, to do this all the more, to do this more and more. Keep on loving one another, he says. Grow in your love for one another, he says. Well, and how do we do that? We do that by beholding the love of God in our incarnate and propitiatory Savior. So we're about to do now in this meal before us. Let's take a moment and pray together. And Father, we, we give you great praise and thanks now for sending your Son to be our atoning sacrifice. That the Son of God has come in the incarnation to be our propitiation. We pray that you would press these realities deep into our hearts now this morning. That we might be deeply affected by them and in turn grow and reflecting your love to one another and to a world that needs it. We pray that, that as we come to the table now, that we would behold the atoning sacrifice of Christ afresh, with eyes that can see, 
and with hearts that are alive to it. That we might be nourished and strengthened through our communion with Christ in this meal. To live and to love like he lived and loved. We pray all this in his name. Amen.